morning, church. Welcome to Woodville this morning. You guys excited to be here with us? Come on, you ready to worship? Stand on your feet. Let's give him praise. Come on. I was nowhere. You came to my rescue. From the grave I've been raised. When I needed a Savior to save me, Jesus, you made a way. Time was blind, but these eyes have been opened. Now I walk in the light. Every step on this road I will follow. Jesus, you me. Come on, you see it out. You are the way.
never gonna let me down. Come on. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. You never let me down, Lord. So faithful. and lows, Lord, you're right there beside us, God, even if we don't feel it, Lord, I know that you're there, because you're a good God, a faithful Father.
Lord, come on. You're powerful, Lord. Jesus. Glorify your name, Lord. We just want to lift you up, Father. Sing of how great you are. There's none like you, Lord. Nothing can rival you. Nothing can stand in your way. Because death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grief. The heavens are roared. The praise of your glory. For you are raised to life. Come on, death couldn't hold you. Sing it. And death could not hold you. The veil tore. Come on. You silenced the boast of sin and grace. And the heavens are roared. name of Jesus. God, we lift up your name this morning. Together with one voice, God, we come together and we exalt you, Lord. We declare how great you are, Father. From our hearts, Lord, how great you are. I'd love to be in your presence, Father. Amen, church. Come on, do you love to be in his presence? I'm going to teach you guys a new song this morning. You ready for a new song? This is a powerful song. This song is a, is a call. It's a call to worship. A call for our soul to awaken and to rise up and to sing praise to God. You ready to do it with us? Come on. There is a sound I love to hear. It's the sound of the Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray, where we hear worship, he hears faith. Come on, you sing that verse with me. There's a sound. There is a sound. 
I love to hear is the sound of the Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray, where we hear worship, he hears his faith. Come on, what a powerful thought, amen. Thank you, Lord. Awake my soul. just sing but sing loud amen I truly believe this church with this song I was just been brewing in my spirit I, I honestly believe you know we're going somewhere at, at a, as a church are we not we all can feel it Woodville's on the move amen and I know we can feel that I know we say I know we talk about it a lot because it's happening and I just kind of felt convicted this week within worship within my own worship within you know us corporately as a, as a worship team um, I just felt, man, I want to go somewhere fresh in our worship as well. You know, I want to go somewhere new. And I really felt singing this song, Awake My Soul and Sing. And sing loud. You know, sing some praise from your spirit this morning. I really feel like this song is going to launch us into a new season of worship here at the church. I really believe that. I believe as we sing this song, songs like these, where we talk about our souls waking up and coming to life. That one verse says, Awake you slumbering and sing your praises loud. It's a part of the song where we really, we actually just shout, hey, oh, 
And I love that. I think it's intentional. My soul just needs to shout unto him, amen? Just needs to shout to you, Father. I sing your praise aloud, Lord. With everything that I got, Lord, I don't stand here, Lord, and just do the same thing week to week. But we want to move forward in our worship, amen, church? And I challenge you this morning, I challenge myself that we'll step up this morning, we'll sing these songs with a, I don't know, a new, a new jump in our step, amen? Just a new song on your lips this morning. Come on, you with me, church? Let's sing this again a couple times. And that's my prayer, that your, your spirit will arise this morning. Your soul will awaken. Oh, wake up, you slumbering. It's time to worship. Come on, you with us? Come on. Let's sing this again. There is a sound that changes things. The sound of his people on their knees. Oh, wake up, you slumbering. It's time to worship. Come on again. There is a sound that changes things. The sound of his people on their knees. Oh, wake up, you slumbering. Come on, do that verse again. Come on, do that verse again. There is the sound that changes things. The sound of his people on their knees. Oh, wake up, you slumbering. It's time to worship him. Awake my soul. great to see each and every one of you and maybe this is your first time here maybe it's been a long time since you've been here or maybe you come here every Sunday we honestly are so glad that you've chosen to be here today thank you so much for coming and a show note welcome to people that are watching online we have we have people in hospitals right now and people who are seniors that couldn't come out and they always say to me just some Sunday pastor wave to me so here it is hello and we got people across our city, our province, our nation, and even around the world that have joined in for this service today. How many people are ready for God's Word? Come on, are you ready for God's Word? Are you ready for God's Word? 
Well, we're in our February sermon series that we've been calling Unlikely. And there's an outline on the back of your bulletin. You could pull that out or you could pull it up on your handheld device. Go to our church website. And the word unlikely simply means not expected to happen. The word unlikely means improbable. It's kind of like you could never in the natural make this happen. But somehow God takes the unlikely and makes it likely. And so today we're going to explore an unlikely encounter. An unlikely encounter with a man named David and an unlikely encounter with a man named Saul. And it's found in an Old Testament book way back in the early pages of the Bible in 1 Samuel chapter 24. And we're going to learn this morning how to properly behave in a cave. And we're going to explore some biblical teaching from 1 Samuel chapter 24. So let's get right to the notes. The first thing I want to talk to you about, number one, I want to explore the injuries of David's life, the emotional injuries of David's life. And we're going to see this morning that, that David, David was a hated man and David was a hunted man. I mean, Saul could not stand David. Saul was the king and David was the young shepherd boy that grew up. He had taken down Goliath. And, and so David represented everything that Saul wasn't. And so Saul was jealous. I mean, everyone was singing the accolades of David. They were saying, Saul has slain the thousands, but David has slain the ten thousands. And, and David was walking under the blessing of God. And so Saul was marked with jealousy. He hated David. He wanted to take down David. He was pursuing David. He wanted to kill David. He wanted to wipe out the threat named David. Sometimes in life, people will be jealous about you. They will dislike you. And they will do stuff to you, not because you've done something wrong, but because you're doing everything right. And sometimes when you're living a life that's honoring to God, some people don't like that. And Saul didn't like David. And so David was a hunted man. David was a hated man. Let's look at verse 1 and verse 2 of 1 Samuel chapter 24. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, I mean the Philistines were the enemy of the Israelites, but this, this battle was taming down. Everything was calming down. He was told David is in the desert of En Gedi. And En Gedi was a desert in the ancient land. And in the ancient land, in the desert, there was these huge mountains that were made of limestone. And these mountains had humongous caves. Don't picture a small cave. Picture a really, really large cave. Large caves in En Gedi. Look at verse 2. So tall, Saul, tall, Saul took 3,000 able young men. And the Hebrew word for able means capable. It means the skilled. It means the best of the best. And so Saul musters up the best of all the best, the most capable, the most skilled man, 3,000 of them, and he's out to get David. He takes 3,000 able men from all Israel, and he set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. A crag is simply a, a rocky place. It's a rock that projects out of a mountain, and it's called the wild goats. In fact, if you went there, you would often see goats on the mountains, and uh, that's where they're trying to find David. And David, we learn in 1 Samuel 23, had 600 men with him, and Saul has 3,000 men, way outnumbered. And Saul is pursuing David. He hates David. He's jealous of David. He wants to kill David. He wants to get him. And David's like, what did I do? I haven't done anything wrong. And Saul is out to get him. Number one, the injuries of David's life. The second thing I want to explore, number two, are the illusions of David's life. The illusions. An illusion is a perception. It, it's not the real deal. You think it's real. It's your perception and you feel it's the right thing, but it's not the right thing. And we're going to explore in a couple of moments the, the illusion of reputation and secondly, the, the illusion of revenge. And so I'm going to read these verses and I think it will make sense. It's verse 3 and verse 4 of 1 Samuel chapter 24. It says he came to the sheep pens. Saul comes to the sheep pens along the way and a cave was there. Now there's a lot of caves, but we're about to see an unlikely encounter. I mean, of all the caves, you won't imagine what happens, but here it comes. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there and Saul went in to relieve himself. You, you, you know what that means, don't you? He had to use the boys room. He had to go number one. 
And, uh, I mean, he's out there. He's probably drinking lots of water because he's supposed to have his eight cups of water every day. And, you know, all that water. He's got to go to the washroom. And so he says to all the guys, you stay out here. Here's a cave. I'm going to go into the cave, and I'm going to relieve myself. I'll just be a moment. Of all the caves, he goes in there. Look at this. He came to the sheep pen. Along the way, a cave was there. Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave of all the caves that Saul could go into. He goes into the cave where David's in. Now, it's a huge cave, so big that 600 people can fit in a big cave. And so I want you to picture this huge cave, and there's these little crevice hallways going everywhere from the cave, and David and the boys are way, 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 way back in the cave, and they're just kind of hanging out and hiding, and and Saul's got to use the boys' room, and he comes into that cave, and he is relieving himself. So let's come back to now the scriptures. Let's go to verse 4. The men said, all these guys are saying to David, This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Church, you need to be careful who you listen to because not everybody's going to say to you what God would want them to say to you. I mean, you read this, you go, that sounds good. But the truth is, you will not find that verse in the Bible. I mean, God never said to them that David's going to have a moment where you can do whatever you want to Saul. They're making it up, and they're like, come on, David. He's right there. Sneak up on him. Take him down. Take him down. You, you should be the king. You should. There's a subtle temptation to listen to the crowd, but we're not supposed to listen to the crowd. We're supposed to listen to the voice of God. And here is David here. Get him. Take him down. This is your moment. His reputation is at stake. And you can have a subtle temptation to think, if I don't listen to them, it's going to reveal weakness. But, but real strength is not revealed in doing what's wrong. Real strength is revealed in doing what is right. And so you've got the illusion of reputation. But then number two, the illusion of revenge. Like, this is your moment. You take him down. He deserves it. He deserves for you to do this. Now, it's a classic story. Let me show you what happens here. It's just just an amazing story. Let's come now into verse 4. In the latter part of verse 4, Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. So here's what happened. Here's the way I think it went down. One day, Saul's walking, drank too much water, has to relieve himself, goes into this cave, David and the boys are in the back. And when Saul walks in, he's the king, and he's wearing this beautiful royal robe. And before he does his thing, he takes off the royal robe, and he probably folds it up and just puts it there, and then goes over there in the cave and does his thing. And David's back here, and the guys are saying, this is the moment, this is the day which the Lord had told you about. Take him down and kill him. And David sneaks up. And Saul's over there, and he goes over to the royal robe, and he bends down, and he takes his knife, and he cuts off the corner of the royal robe, and he runs back. And then Saul puts on his robe, and now he's wearing a mini skirt. I mean, it sounds like a really cool college prank. It really does. I mean, the, 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 the illusion, the illusion of reputation and the illusion of revenge. I mean, I mean, we're not supposed to do the revenge thing and we're not s- supposed to be concerned about how people view us. We're more concerned about God and we're more concerned about leaving revenge to God. And so we see number two, the illusion of their reputation, his reputation, and the illusion of revenge. I want to take you to number three, because this is the heart of the message. Here's where I want to take you to. I want to talk to you, number three, about the integrity of David's life. The integrity of David's life. Number one, the injuries of David's life. Number two, the, the illusions. And then number three, the integrity. And integrity is a great word. And integrity needs to be redeemed in society. And it needs to be redeemed in the church. And, and here we're going to see that David, this man who's growing in God, just passed the test of integrity and God was beginning to work on him. Three things about the integrity of David's life. Number one, I want to talk to you for a moment about the integrity of his character. The integrity of his character. 
And I want to explore for a couple of moments, verse 5 down to verse 7. And you're about to see that integrity shone out in his character. Look at verse 5. Afterward, I mean, he just cut off that little corner of the robe and he runs back. And the Bible says, afterward, he was, he was conscience stricken. It's like a cut to his heart for cutting off a corner of his robe. I know it feels like a, a humorous college prank, but, but there's some things that we sometimes forget when we study this text. Number one, number one, the robe was a symbol of the kingship of Saul. It was the royal robe. And many Bible scholars say when he snuck up and he cut off the corner of the robe and he took it, it was like he's stealing the kingship, trying to take what's not his yet and, and get it and remove it. It's like he's robbing the kingship from Saul. It's like a transferring of kingship and it was wrong. But there's something else that we often miss. Our text says that he cut off the corner of his robe. And when you read the book of Numbers, on the corners of the royal robe were the tassels. And the tassels represented these ancient commandments and in essence what David did he deframed the royal robe and he was stealing a transfer of the kingship from Saul to David he should never have done it now here's what I love about David it didn't take him two weeks to get convicted there was rapid repentance and he was struck in his heart and he immediately repents I want to be like that I want when I mess up I want to fess up quickly, and then I want to dress up and do what's right. I want to be the person that admits I was wrong quickly. And church people of integrity admit when they are wrong quickly and quickly repent. I call it rapid repentance. And our text says that he was struck in his conscience for cutting off a corner of his robe. Look at verse 6. He said to his man, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master. Now, I, I want to push pause because sometimes when you read the Bible, we read it so da, 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 da. But we forget that there's feelings and there's emotions. Now, the book of Samuel records the history of David, but the book of Psalms reveals his heart. And, and if you read Psalm 57, write down Psalm 57, Psalm 57, and Psalm 142, Psalm 142, these Psalms were written by David in the cave. And in Psalm 57 and in Psalm 142, he reveals his heart. Samuel records the history. So let, let me do my best to, to, to help us see this. And let's come back. Let's come back and just let, let the word of God just speak to us. He said to his man in verse 6, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for, for he's the anointed of the Lord. Look at verse 7. With these words, David didn't just rebuke. He sharply rebuked his man. And he did not allow his man to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went on his way. I want you to picture David. He's now back there. And he's holding on to a part of the royal robe. And now he's convicted. I should have done that. And then Saul leaves the cave. And he turns to these 600 guys. Guys, I was wrong. I shouldn't have done this. I forbid you from taking down that man. We should never touch God's anointed. He was cut to the core of his heart and he's dripping with repentance. Do you see the integrity of his character? The second thing I want to zero on, number two, number two, the integrity of his confrontation. And I, I, I want for a couple of moments to take you to verse 8 down to verse 15. And I want to explore what I saw in verse 8 to 15. This is the heart of the message. And I saw some biblical steps, some biblical principles of how to properly respond when somebody has wronged you. You ever been wronged? Somebody ever done something to you that hurts your boss, your, your spouse, your, your ex, your child, your, your brother, your sister, your pastor, somebody in your church, one of your colleagues, your neighbor? You, you've been wronged. And you, you don't know how to handle it. Now look this way. I'm not responsible for your actions or your reactions, but I am responsible for my actions and my reactions. And a person of integrity wants to respond properly when they have been wronged. So let's look at our text this morning. 
Let me very quickly give you seven principles that I saw of how David handled this. Seven biblical steps, seven biblical principles. We're going to go quickly. Number one, number one, David took the first step. I mean, he, it's a huge step. And I see it in verse eight. I mean, in verse eight, it says, David went out of the, of the cave and he called out to Saul. I mean, he calls out to Saul, the guy who wants to kill him, and he takes a risk to make things right. It is a risk to take the first step. But if you're waiting for the other person to make the first move, you might be waiting a long time. I mean, when we walk in integrity, we take the first step. We say, I'm going to do something about this. I'm going to do what I can. I'm going to handle my reactions and my actions. I'm going to do what I can to bring resolution to this. Number one, number one, David took the first step. And then there's number two. I love this. David honored Saul. David honored Saul. If you've ever been in the military or a cadet or served in any capacity with the army, you know this. You don't salute the man, you salute the rank. And I want you to see that David, although Saul the king was out to get him and to hurt him, he still honored the king. And and it says here in verse 8, look at the screen, he said, My Lord, my Lord the king. You see, church, honor elevates, dishonor decimates. Honor is when you release blessing. Honor is when you see the good. Honor is when you speak life. Honor is is a God quality. Honor is something that needs to be redeemed in all of our lives. Honor lifts up. Dishonor tears down. You've got to honor one another. Honor is a wonderful, integral principle. And David honored Saul. Number one, he took the first step. Number two, he honored Saul. Number three, David humbled himself before Saul. And it says here in our Bible, when, when Saul looked behind him, he just heard David yelling out, my Lord, the king. He looks behind him and, and David bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. I mean, Saul is walking out, and I don't know how far he was, but he was in earshot because he heard the voice of David. And David calls out to him, says, my Lord, the king. And he looks back, and here's Davy. Davy is down like this, on his face, on his face as low as he could get, humbling himself. Humility. Do you know what the opposite of humility is? Let me give you a clue. It starts with the letter P. And it ends with an E, and it has an R-I-D in the middle. The opposite of humility is shouted out. One, two, three. Pride. Pride repels. Humility attracts. God is calling us to not walk in pride, but to be clothed and dripping with humility. Humility says I'm not perfect. Humility says I'm still a work in progress. Humility says I I care about this relationship. Humility says I I want to do all I can to to help make this right. Humility, humility is a God-given principle. And David humbled himself before Saul. Number one, he took the first step. Number two, he honored Saul. Number two, he, he humbled himself before Saul. But then, then there's number four. He spoke the truth concerning the situation. I mean, some people think if I make this right, does that mean I have to neglect how I feel and I got to ignore how I feel with this? And no, 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 no. He spoke the truth concerning the situation. Look at verse 9. Look at verse 9 and verse 10. In verse 9, he said to Saul, why, why do you listen when men say David is bent on harming you? Again, we're reading our text. Psalms gives the heart. Samuel gives the fact. And so the Hebrew language sometimes get lost. But, but here's David, and he's dripping with humility. And, and here's David. He's, he's walking in honor, and he's revealing his heart. And, and, and he looks at, at David, or he looks at Saul. Why, why do you listen when men say David is bent on harming you? Verse 10, this day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you. But I spared you. I said, I will, I'm not going to lay my hand on, on you, my Lord, because he's the Lord's anointed. He spoke the truth concerning the situation. Now, 
How, how many people know that the devil is the prince of the air, right? And so sometimes when I'm talking to you, I'm trying to get what's in my heart, in my head, out of my mouth, get into your ears and your heart, and you understand it. But, but in marriage, in marriage, if your house is like my house, the devil tries to twist my words going to Evelyn, and Evelyn's words come into me, and it just doesn't go well, and you have a little bit of intense fellowship, a fight. And we were dating, and I'm, I'm, I'm 22 years of age, and I, I drive from, from a small little town in southwestern Ontario courting this girl in Toronto and save my money, and I get there and said, Babe, I want to take you out for supper. Where would you like to go? And she said, Oh, I don't know. You decide. So I decided. I said, Let's go to Swiss Chalet. And she said, No, I don't want to go there. So I think she's trying to pick a fight with me. And really what she's saying to me, if you really love me, you'll know where I want to go. No, ladies, look this way. We guys aren't the smartest people in the world. We cannot read in between lines. Tell us what you really want. All the men said, amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Yeah. We can't read your mind. We can't. Sometimes your feelings get hurt. And sometimes in our marriage, you know, Evelyn will say, well, well, you hurt me, and this is what you did. And I'm like, no, I didn't, but I don't say that anymore. <laughs> I've learned I've got to let her take ownership of how she feels. Because that's her perception. And, and sometimes it's the other way around. And, and, and David is just revealing the truth, the absolute truth concerning the situation. He's putting the facts out on the table and he's revealing what happened. 2.5, the fifth thing I want you to see is that David took responsibilities for his wrongdoing. He took responsibility for his wrongdoing. He owned what he did that was wrong. Look at verse 11. He said, see my father. And you're like, he called him father. Yes. Did you know that Saul was David's father-in-law? David had married Saul's daughter, Michael. And sometimes the hurt is deeper when it comes from somebody closer. And, and here, here's David and talking. And he said, see, see my father. Look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I want you for a moment to picture David standing before Saul and, and he's holding on to the, the piece of the royal robe that he had cut. He'd snuck up and he, and he cut it off and, and now his, his conscience is stricken and he's known that he's wrong and, and he's, he's admitting he's wrong and he's showing the bit of the robe to Saul like, I was wrong. I should never have done this. I was wrong. I should have done this. Forgive me. See, my father, look at the piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but did not kill you. See that there's nothing in my hand to indicate that I'm guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I've not wronged you, but you're hunting me down to take my life. This is the first moment that David revealed how he really felt, but then David owned, David owned his wrongdoings. But then there's number six, and I love this. He ultimately surrendered his offense to God. In verse 12, it says, May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me. I mean, ultimately, David surrendered his offense to God. Our son Jonathan and his wife had three girls, age one, age three, and age five. Our one-year-old is now starting to talk. Her fourth word was Alexa. I find that interesting. <laughs> our five-year-old, when she was three-year-old, would, would come to our house, and she'd put on a cape, and she'd run through the family room singing that song from Frozen. Let it go! Let it go! I should have brought her on the platform as the special music this morning. Because sooner or later, you've got to let that offense go and release it to God. 
Some of you, it's playing in your mind. It's playing in your heart. You wake up thinking about it. You go to bed thinking about it. You're sitting there right now going, well, Mark, you don't know what my ex did me. Mark, you don't know what my son did. You don't know what my daughter did. You don't know what my brother did. You don't know what my boss did. It's eating you up on the inside. It's eating you up like yesterday's lunch. And you can't shake it. And I think the word this morning is in Jesus' name. you got to let it go go and release it to God Almighty. Somebody give a little clap offering of praise to our God today. Let it go. Well, Mark, you don't know what they did. You are not responsible for their action or their reaction, but you're responsible for your action. And you're responsible for your reaction. Ultimately, David surrendered his offense to God. But then there's number seven. David committed himself to doing the right thing. He really did. And I want to call you and I today to start doing the right thing. Start now. I'm going to do the right thing. Let me read you verse 12, the latter part of verse 12, down to verse 15. He said, but my hands will not touch you. As the old saying goes, from evildoers come evil deeds. My hand, my hand will not touch you, Saul. Verse 14, against whom has the king of Israel come out? Who are you pursuing? A dead dog, a flea. May the Lord be our judge and decide between us. May he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hands. Church, when you take it in your own hands, you're going to mess it up. But when you release it to God and let it go, God will take over. The final thing that I want to share with you as we're walking through this teaching today, I want to end number three with the integrity of his consolation. And I want you to see what happened in the end of this story because David walked through these biblical steps and I really think he did what was right. And it's an amazing ending. Look at verse 16. When David finished saying this, Saul asked, is, is that your voice, David, my son? I mean, the guy who was hunting after David and hated David now says, is that your voice, my son? And he wept aloud. There's a breaking. There's a bit of a restoration. There's a bit of, bit of a reconciliation. Look at verse 17. You're more righteous than I, he said. You've treated me well, but I've treated you so badly. You, you've just told me about the good you did to me. The Lord delivered me into your hands, but, but you didn't kill me, David. Look at verse 19. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away un unharmed? May the Lord reward you well for the way you treated me today. Verse 20, I know that you will surely be king. Saul now realizes that David's going to become king. I know that you're going to become king and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. But then he says in verse 21, now swear to me by the Lord that you will not kill off my descendants or wipe out my name. For my father's family. In verse 22. So David gave his oath to Saul. Then Saul returned home. But David and his men. Went up to his stronghold. We sometimes miss that final word. Stronghold. Because David knew that even though there was a healing. It still wasn't finished. And sometimes when restoration and forgiveness flows. It's a lifelong journey. It was 1879, and a guy in England actually invented the light bulb. I don't even know his name. You're going, it's Thomas Edison. No, stay with me. I know the story. A guy in England invented a light bulb, but he couldn't make it last more than two hours. And then this guy named Thomas Edison, he invented a light bulb that lasted, and he, he got together a group of people, and they worked diligently. It took them 24 hours hours solid to make one light bulb and they worked hard they put it together 24 hours one light bulb and he gives it to this young worker to carry upstairs he said take it upstairs so the young guy takes the light bulb and he's walking up the stairs you probably know where the story's going and he trips and he shatters the light bulb 
And so Thomas Edison is like, no way, this can't be happening. So he goes back, gets the guys together, and for another 24 hours, they make the second light bulb. They make it, they pull it together, they get it together. Now, if I was Thomas Edison, I would carry that upstairs myself. But he didn't. He looked at the same young boy. He said, here, son, take it upstairs. See, forgiveness builds trust. Unforgiveness eats you up. And there's some of you people today sitting here right now, the reason why you are stuck in your journey is because unforgiveness is clinching in your heart. I pray that God would give you and me rapid repentance. That we would be like David. We'd say, I should never have snuck up and cut that part of your robe. I shouldn't have done it. I was wrong. Forgive me. Yeah, but, but Mark, Saul hated him. Saul hunted him down. David was not responsible for Saul's actions, but David was responsible for his actions. And when David repented of his part, it released repentance in Saul's part. I'll tell you, church, when forgiveness truly flows daily in our lives, we are opening ourselves up for a release of the further blessing of God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh God, help everyone in this place to respond properly and biblically that we would walk a life of forgiveness. Could you put your hands together and celebrate our Lord God? Come on, put, come on, put your hands together and celebrate. Come on, put your hands together and celebrate our Lord God. I want you to stand to your feet with me. Father God, I pray as Pastor Brad and the worship band and team begin to lead us in worship to you. I ask Almighty God that there would be a freedom that would flow in this house. I pray God that we would unfreeze this morning. And that we would live out just like that song from Frozen. Let it go. I ask in the name of the Lord that there would be a letting go in this place today. Father, I sense that there's people standing here today that the hurt, the wound, the, 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 the this thing that happened was, is so deep and it's so clinching in their heart. I just ask God that you would take us into a level of freedom and that we would let it go. Let it go. I feel the Lord God wants me to say today that people can only hurt you if you allow them to hurt you. People can only hurt you if you allow the hurt to get in you. The longer I live, the more I realize when people hurt me, and I've been hurt, Oh, trust me, I've been hurt. Oh, yeah. I now realize hurt people hurt people. And I've learned to live my life with thick skin, to not let the hurt get into my spirit. Thick skin, but tender heart. And when I read the scripture today, I, I'm realizing that I, I need to be clothed with the humility of God Almighty. Now, just before Pastor Brad leaves us in the song, I, I feel the Lord prompting me again like he did in first service. I just felt the Lord saying to me in first service, and I feel it very strongly right now, that there's a lot of you going, Mark, you, you don't get it. You don't know what happened. I can never let it go. Here's what I feel the Lord wants me to say. Just posture your heart to be willing to let it go and then allow God to help you to let it go. You can't let it go on your own, but when you posture your heart to say, God, I want to let it go. Now help me to let it go. 
there's going to be a freedom that's going to flow in this place. How many people want there to be a freedom flowing in this place today? I said, how many people want there to be a freedom? I wish I had time to explore all the scriptures in the New Testament with unforgiveness, but unforgiveness can be a barricade to your receiving of your God miracle. And I feel the Lord saying to me this morning that if we allow ourselves this moment, there's going to be a God moment in this place. There's going to be an unlikely encounter in this place this morning. And, and it's, going to, it's going to be a watershed moment. It's, it's like there's going to be a washing away of unforgiveness and bitterness. And it's just, you're just going to find a freedom that's going to begin to flow. So, so I'm just going to pray, Pastor, and then lead us in the song once. And then we're going to transition to an altar time. But I just pray right now, God, that as Pastor Brad begins to lead us, let there be an awakening in our soul and let there be a freedom that would flow and let unforgiveness be broken and gone. I pray it in Jesus' name. Everybody shouted amen. amen. I said everybody shouted amen. amen. So we're going to sing a song. But I don't want you just to sing a song. I want you to worship in this song. And Pastor, thank you for teaching this song to us. I, I believe that there's going to be an awakening this morning. So come on, church. You love to worship. Take a few more moments. Lift your hands. Lift your voice. Let's sing to the Lord. There is a sound that changes things. The sound of His people on their oh, Wake up, you slumbering. It's time to worship Him. There is a sound that changes things. The sound of His people on their knees. Oh, wake up, you slumbering. It's time to worship Him. Awake. that every head would be bowed and everyone's eyes would be closed just two things in these final moments and the first thing is this and, and I address this to everyone on the main level the balcony the risers and everyone that's watching on live streaming and the question is this if today 
was the day that you died and you stepped into eternity. Do you know that you know that you're going to heaven? I, I don't want you to walk out of this place thinking, well, I, I hope I'm going or I, I think I'm going. I want you to walk out of this place knowing beyond any shadow of doubt that you're going to heaven. The Bible says some 2,000 years ago, God sent his son Jesus to this world and you're the reason. And Jesus died on a cross. He gave his life for you. They put him in the grave. Third day, he arose to life. And the answer to life is Jesus. Have you personally asked Christ to be the center of your life? Have you invited Him to be your Lord and your Savior? Have you asked Him to be the center of your life? The key to heaven is a personal walk with God. Asking Him to be your Lord and Savior. In just a moment, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. In just a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond. In just a moment, if you're, you're standing here today and you're like, I want to be ready for heaven. I want to be included in a prayer and led in a prayer. I, I, all I'm going to ask you to do in a moment is to lift your hand. And by lifting your hand, you're letting me know, Mark, I want Christ in my life. I want this peace that is found in Jesus. I want this Maybe you've never done that before. Or maybe you did a long time ago, but today you're like, I, I want to settle. I, I just want to get this right. I want Christ to be the center of my life. I'm just going to count the three. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. And if you'd like to be included and led in this prayer, I think I'm the only one looking right now. I want you just to lift your hand. And you can put it down. And by lifting your hand, you're letting me know, Mark, I want to be led in this prayer. One, two, three. If that's you, you just lift your hand up as high as you can. And once you've done that, you can put your hand down. Bless you, friends. You put your hands down. And if you lifted your hand, I want to lead you in this prayer. And we're going to join you as you pray. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, I ask you into my life. Please forgive me of my sins. I have decided to follow Jesus. Today I repent. Today I confess you as my Savior and my Lord, I make my peace with you in Jesus' name. Amen. Open your eyes. Can we celebrate right now? Come on. Come on, Woodfell. Can we celebrate salvations? Now, there's a lot of people that lifted their hand. And if you did that and you asked Christ in your life, you made the best decision of your life. And if you don't attend a life-giving, Bible-believing church, honestly, we'd love you in the journey. We, we love having fun. And we'd love to have you here. And on your way out in a couple of moments, follow all, big word follow. We got a Bible for you. It's free. We want to give you one. No strings attached. A little booklet. It's free. And we have a class called Follow that happens on, on Wednesday nights. They can tell you about that. It's in the bulletin. And if you're not in a connect group, get into a connect group group and find your place of serving and I want us one more time to thank all of our guests for coming come on come on now in a couple of moments I'm going to lead us specifically in prayer I told you there was number two before I come to that second reason guys in case you forgot this coming Friday is Valentine's Day no pressure at all no pressure. Now, several things. Number one, I waited too late to book the restaurant. I tried last night, couldn't get into the restaurant that I wanted, so we got to go out on Thursday night. And just for the record, McDonald's doesn't count on Valentine's. Just saying, all right? Come on, ladies. Are you with me, ladies? Valentine's doesn't count. Now, Pastor Marvin's arranged for this. We got a little booklet for every married couple as you walk out. It's, it's called a marriage tune-up, and it's a gift for you today, married couples. So just, you know, do that, and guy... Get on the phone and book, book a nice place, Valentine's, just saying. All right, enough of that. Sorry, guys, enough of that. I want you just to bow your heads these final moments. I, I just felt a solemn moment before we close. And here's what we're going to do. I really feel I need to pray for those that need God's help to let it go. To let it go. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Here's honesty time. And I think as you respond to this, it's, it's you taking the first step that you, you want to be free from this. I, I, I feel there's a lot of you standing here right now. There's somebody that has hurt you. And the residue of that hurt is still on your life. And you don't want it. You want to let it go. You want these principles lived out. You want to be free. I want to pray for you before we go. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed, please. Now, if that's you today and you'd like to be included in this prayer, 
I want you right now just to quickly lift your hand up and you can put it down after you've done that. Yeah. Yeah. Put your hand down. Father God, I pray for everyone that lifted their hand. I pray that you'd help them to live out these truths and to walk in freedom and to let it go. I pray in the name of the Lord that this would be a new day. This would be the beginning of better days. That God, now that they've opened themselves to this, help them, Lord, to walk in forgiveness and freedom. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Nobody whispered, everybody shouted. Amen. Can we give another clap offering of praise to our Lord God? Come on. Come on. Come on. We can do better than that. Come on. To the Lord. To the Lord. Well, God bless you, wonderful people. On your way out, if you're picking up your children, thank those children's workers out in the parking lot. Thank the parking attendants. They're the heroes today. They're outside on the coldest day. So God bless you. Have a great day and a great week.